Hey everyone and welcome back to The Leadership Project with your host Mick Spears. We bring you thought-provoking guests and topics every week to challenge your thinking about leadership. Our aim is to help you become the leader that you wish you always had as we learn together and lead together. Hey everyone, welcome back to The Leadership Project. I'm greatly honoured today to be joined by Dr. Paige Williams. She is an author, researcher, and a PhD in organizational behavior. She's a trusted advisor and mentor to senior leaders, and she uses a potent mix of neuroscience, psychology, and her own experience to help leaders to surface uncomfortable truths, to break through and lead themselves, their teams, and their organizations so that they can have the environment where they can thrive. She's also the author of a book called own it that addresses accountability specifically in a post-pandemic world and I'm really interested to know a little bit more about that and this thing about surfacing uncomfortable truths so I think this is going to be a really rich conversation so Paige thank you so much for joining us please do say hello to our audience and give us a little flavor of that rich background of yours and what led you to be with us today now fabulous thank you so much for inviting me here Mick it's great to be with you and and hi everyone I'm really interested in understanding how can we be better leaders Uh, leaders of ourselves leaders of our teams leaders of organizations but you know leaders of families and friendship groups I I have this phrase that I use which is leadering rather than leadership And, and we all do leadering all the time even if it's just leading ourselves and sometimes that's the most important work and absolutely the place to start um so where did I begin so I have a background in business and and leading organizations And I did that for 20 years or so in Europe and the UK um, and then came to Australia where I um, became interested in positive psychology and was at the the real um, beginning of it over here um, and worked with Martin Seligman and uh, was part of the team that brought it in at Geelong Grammar School, which really was the first organizational application of the science of well-being. Um, and that lead me, led me to my PhD studies and, and thinking about how can we create thriving systems, specifically using leaders and leadering as the leverage point. Mm. And I believe that it's the most powerful leverage point in any system, whether that's an individual, whether it's a team, whether it's a family, whether it's a, you know, a football team, whether it's a whole organization, leadering and the way that we, how we show up, what we do and who we are. Um, is how we create change. Um, And I specifically look at how can we create change that helps us in some way be better Um, and understanding even what being better looks like, what good looks like, is a really interesting question for us to explore. But so that's how I've come to kind of play in the space that I'm playing in at the moment. Um, And I became super interested in accountability through my first book, which was because, which is called becoming anti fragile, and this idea of anti fragility taking us beyond resilience, so that we don't just bounce back through um, challenging experience. We actually learn beyond them. We actually grow and learn through them, and we become better in some way because of them. But the first thing we have to do, and we need to really think about, is what's making and keeping us fragile because that's always going to create a ceiling to how anti-fragile we can become. And my research and my lived experience is that one of the things that most often makes and keeps us fragile are issues with accountability. And so that's kind of my story as to how I've come to be working as I am, but also the narrative arc around why own it and why honouring and amplifying accountability. So first of all, we're huge fans of Seligman on the show. So thank you. Uh, and thank you for helping leverage his work. And I'm sure that we're, we're going to get enthralled today by what you've done with that. So great news. Uh, second, with your introduction that you've just shared, I, I think I need to warn the audience, the episode is now going to be seven hours long. This <laughs> There is so much to unpack there, but uh, jokes aside, man, um, I've got an insatiable curiosity, so that I'm, I'm really interested in so many things that you've just said. Let's start with leadering versus leadership. When you say leadering, uh, what does that mean to you? 
So um, leadering is an action. Leadering is a way of being. Leadering is how you show up for yourself and others in the world. Mm. Um, and it has very little to do with your position in a formal hierarchy. Um, it has very little to do with what's in your position description or the role that you hold perhaps in a team or an organization. Um, and so leadering is a personal choice that we make in each moment, in every day, mm. around how we show up, how we how we lead ourselves, how we invite others to lead with us, mm. and um, the impact that we have through those things. So leadership is a noun, whereas leadering is a verb. Um, yeah. And it's a it's a verb that that really is about choices that we make consciously and less than consciously in every moment of each day. Two really powerful words are popping into my head as I hear that page. If I can test those with you, the first one is intentionality. So showing up with the intention to lead, and the second one is identity. So one would be doing. So we are going to do something in in relation, intentional actions of leadership. And the second one was being and understanding who we are as a leader. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and that's a beautiful summary of the the being doing, the the ising and the asing. Um and that's um that's something that Eckhart Tolle, Tolle speaks around is um the the ising is the being of it. How are we being? And the asing is the doing of it. And so when we think about that, leadering is the 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 ising of leadering and being the being a leader. Um, and that starts with, as you say, understanding yourself through that lens and the possibility that that opens up to you. Mm. And also alongside that, the responsibility that it, it brings as well. And so this idea of intentionality is so important. And it's so powerful in that we're not just kind of tripping through our experience and, and, and kind of like a pinball bouncing off the, the, the little pings and the, and the actual little um, mechanisms. We're actually intentionally going, no, this is, this is how I choose to be. This is what I choose to do with this purpose and impact in mind. Mm -hmm. and, and using that as our intentional way to move through life. Um, and our experiences of life um, is is leadering is leadering full stop. Yeah. Okay, let's start with that identity and the being uh, element of this, and showing up as a leader and understanding who we are. There's a lot of people out there, and I used to get shocked at this, but now I'm no longer shocked. I've heard so many stories of this now that it's just almost commonplace, and that's imposter syndrome. So we've got a lot of people out there that don't have a good understanding of who they are or if they do have an understanding, they question it. What advice can you give to people that want to be a better leader that may be struggling with their own identity and how they see themselves in the world? So I think that um, we've become very externally referenced and so we try to find, ironically, we're trying to find ourselves outside of ourselves. And I think that this, I call this being untethered. Um, and um, actually the way that we become, the way that we step into the almost like the first few steps of leadering is to locate ourselves in ourselves. And what that takes is actually rather than looking for the answers outside is um the slowing down and the looking inward and becoming self-referencing in understanding what's okay and not okay here. What are my values? What's important to me? And actually thinking about doing the, the work of thinking about what does good look like for me? How do I want to be in the world? What does that mean that I say yes and no to? What are the behaviors that take me towards that or away from it. There's a beautiful framework. It's in kind of counseling psychology called choice points. Um, and it comes out of the work of um, um, active constructive therapy, ACT. Um, and it's about um, as you as you kind of come into experience or come into situations, what moves you towards 
who you want to be in this moment and what moves you away from it. And it's this idea of conscious intentionality around what we do moment to moment. Mm. But unless we understand what moves us towards and what we want to move towards, we've got no reference point to make those choices from, those decisions from. And so this idea of rather than looking outward of uh, uh, all the time as of what good looks like, how is it that one of the things that we need to do is actually go inward and almost reconnect with our gut and, and what feels right, what feels true, who am I, who do I want to be as the best version of myself in leadering? And that's not to say that you might not have people that you go, I really admire my, that person and I really aspire to be aspects of that person. But it's not it's not just taking those as the only reference point. It's actually coming inward and locating um, what good looks like in terms of who you want to be as a leader um, with who you are mm-hmm. um, and, and what's important to you and what matters to you. Um, and so I think that's, that's where the identity piece, it's almost like well, we have no sense. Many people feel they have no sense of identity because we haven't actually paid enough attention or spent enough time with ourselves to understand what that might be. The word that's popping into my mind now is clarity. So what I'm hearing in all of that is if you want to find yourself in this, that you need some clarity of who the leader is that you want to be, this picture. We have a concept here at the Leadership Project called the Amalgam Leader, where we think about all of the leaders that we've had in the past and we think about the good and the bad and we pick the the attributes and the values of the inspirational leaders and what are the things that we learn from that, not to mimic it, but what do we learn from that. And then the horrible bosses, and we've all had them, the horrible bosses that we've had in the past, and they go into a checklist of things that I never want to do that to another human being kind of kind of thing. And then you start getting this picture of the leader that you want to be. And with that clarity, you can then set the intentionality. You, you can even make it a checkpoint. You can have this picture of, okay, that's the leader I want to be. How would they act in this situation? How does that sit with you, Paige? Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And what I love about that, Mick, is that, yes, you know, we, we're often um, encouraged to think about what does, what does best scenario look like? What does good look like? But equally in the work that I did with Anti-Fragility, and it's based in the work of Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who wrote the original book, Anti-Fragile. And he located that in political and economic systems. But one of the things that he talked about is that actually what, what can make us most anti-fragile most quickly is is removing, is understanding what we don't want and getting super, super clear on that. Now, we have a natural negativity bias in the way our brains are wired. And so it can be very easy for us to talk about leaders that we didn't enjoy and that didn't light us up and that didn't bring out the best in us. But actually, as you say, using that as a learning, how do we learn from that? How do we get clearer around what the boundaries are that we won't cross? Mm. And and actually, what's a more nuanced conversation in that is where are the gray areas of that? Yeah. So black and white, fairly clear to see, right? But when we think about the leader that we want to be, where are those times where we might be getting competing commitments coming in? And if we've got this and this and they're both in play and they're competing with each other, like which one of our values is going to win or how are we going to manage that tension? Because very rarely is life black and white. It's various shades of gray mostly. And so how we navigate the gray is a critical part of who we are and how we lead her. And so this idea of getting clear about what's not acceptable, understanding what good looks like, what we aspire to and what we can learn from, but then also exploring that area in the middle, which is gray. And, and, And when does good become acceptable, become okay? And then when do we slip into the not okay? And it's that boundary that we that can kind of slip us across to who we don't want to be as a leader. And if it's small enough, we can kind of be there without even being aware of it. This is super powerful, uh, powerful uh, page. And the word that did pop into my head as you were talking there was boundaries. And there's a lot of people that talk about boundaries. You see a lot of self-help people talk about boundaries and they often talk about boundaries very tangibly. They talk about like, I'm not going to take a call after 7 p.m. or I'm 
I'm reserving this time for myself. And by the way, I uh, subscribe to that. I think it's a very good idea to set those physical boundaries. What I'm hearing from you is more about values-based boundaries. So by having clarity of who I am and what my values are, I am going to be ready to be more decisive in those gray area situations because I know who I am. I know who I want to be. And then if I get put into a ethical dilemma situation, I've got a set of guidelines where I'm going to be able to be more decisive and to lead my team in a way that's going to feel right. How does that sit with you? Yeah, absolutely. And, and what it does is by doing by doing that that work and that thinking around those kind of, as you say, almost like values-based ethical dilemmas, when we're faced with them in real time, they don't kind of trip us up and we're not kind of rabbit in the headlights. Mm -hmm. We're actually able to go, oh, yeah, I've done... I've done this kind of thinking before. So I've got a sense of where my where my moral compass is or what my guiding principle or heuristic yeah. is here. And I, I I do some beautiful, I do beautiful work with leaders around, you know, what are your values? And they're like, oh, what are my leadership values? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> you know, you might think that there's a, a leader in you and a, a real you, but actually they're the same. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about what your values are and how you might bring them to life in your non-professional, in your personal life. And how they might have opportunity to be brought to your life through your leadering and your professional work, or your work roles. And, and then we kind of go through and what happens? Where are those boundary areas? Where are the gray areas? Where are the competing commitments? And, and, and actually taking time to think about that means that when we're faced with the experience of that, we're actually more able to navigate our way through them successfully for ourselves and for other people in that scenario, whether it is our friends and family or whether it's our team and organization. So actually, clarity comes, action precedes clarity. And the action that I'm, in, I'm inviting here and encouraging your listeners to take is spend the time, spend some time with yourself, find out what's important, consider what your values are, think about what are those values look like in action you know in in positive psychology there's a beautiful strengths based framework that uh, that Seligman and Peterson developed in the early 2000s called the values in action framework and it talks about the 24 kind of highest strengths what 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 the best of the human condition looks like um, and then puts them into behavioral statements effectively. And, and this is our, this is our work to do, um, in terms of getting to know ourselves as a, as a leader and thinking about what our leadering looks like in the world, the, the being and the doing to actually take the values. You know, you might have a value of, um, learning. Okay. So what does that mean? What does that mean you do? What are you, how are you showing up? How does, how do, what does that mean is acceptable and not acceptable? Where are the gray areas? Um, so to actually kind of do the work, to take action is what will take us towards that clarity of getting to know ourselves. And we're able to move through life so much more with more ease and grace once we have that in place because we've got these guiding heuristics and we've got a sense of groundedness in knowing who we are. Mm. So I'm like loving this uh, values in action and thinking about uh, putting things in place that embody the leader that we want to be. And then this element of learning, for me, it, that requires reflection. So, so the more you learn about yourself, then at the end of the, each day, if you've done the work where you understand your values and beliefs, you've developed a leadership credo, if you like, at the end of the day, you can give yourself an honest scorecard about was I true to my values and beliefs today? Was I true to my credo? And what did I learn about myself today? And then it's a dynamic thing. The more you learn about yourself, the more you can converge on that leader you want to be. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, there's a there's a great tool that I um, that I use, um, and it's a reflective tool, and it kind of comes out of Kolb's reflective learning cycle, but it also speaks to Carol's Dweck, Carol Dweck's work around growth mindset. It's called the Learning Loop, and it's basically try something, try something new, or or reflect on something you've done your day, and then three questions: What went well? Where did I struggle? What can I learn? That's your kind of assessment. <laughs> Looking at that, what will I do differently next time? And because 
uh, I think accountability is pretty important. And when will I do it? So do something, assess what went well, where did I struggle? What can I learn? And then adjust. What will I do differently next time? And when will I put that into action? And that's just a beautiful, really kind of quick way called the learning loop to learn forward through our experiences. And that's part of what's in the, um, in the Becoming Anti-Fragile book. We, we have a self-reflection journal here at the Leadership Project that people download off our website. And it has five questions. Uh, uh, what went well today? What didn't go well today? Uh, what would I do differently next time if I had my time again? What did I learn about myself today? And what did I learn about others? And we, we encourage this practice uh, every day. At, and I want to take it to a next level because of what you're saying about the loops is then the key is to make sure it's not just single loop, that you go to double loop and triple loop. Now, I'll, I'll take a, a, a very short time to explain that to the audience because that might be a new thing for them. So single loop is very transactional. What went well today? What would I do differently next time? It's, it's kind of perfecting your craft, if you like. Whereas double loop learning is reflecting on your thinking. How did I think about that? And, and it's almost like a critical reasoning around your thinking skills. And, and triple loop is then about identity and how you see yourself in the world. What did I learn about myself? And did my vision of myself change because of the actions of what happened today? Yeah. Is that the type of thing that you're talking about with the, with the loop? loop? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what did I do? How did I, how did I do it? So like the metacognition. So what did I do is, is here. The metacognition is, takes a step back from that. And then the triple loop is, and what did I learn about myself or um, who and how I want to be is the, is the kind of the 3D. And so, yeah, absolutely. That's uh, and and what's lovely about it is that the, what you're, putting through the learning loop can be something that is quite transactional or it can be that question of did I move towards or away from who I want to be as a leader today and and, and that can be like it could be that kind of holistic assessment of how did I go today with showing up in my leadering as I want to that's a really powerful question did I move towards or away from the leader that I want to be that's a really powerful question I'm going to remember that one you mentioned something a little while ago I've not heard of, and I'd love to unpack that a little bit more. ACT, what is ACT? It's, it's a, definitely a type of, psych, of therapy, and it's about us separating from our thoughts and being able to understand that our stories are just that. They are the way that our brain makes sense of the, of the world, but it's a narrative that we are creating. Um, and what can happen is when we get too close to it, when too, too attached to that narrative and to that story, we get kind of caught up in it. And it's a bit like being in a washing machine. Whereas when we're able to separate from it, we're able to kind of look at that story or that narrative and see that we are not the story and we have a choice around how that story how that story impacts us. Mm. So there's an it's called acceptance commitment therapy. Um, and so it's about accepting that this is this this is the story that we're creating and and making a choice around is this story helping us or is it not helping us mm. and what might be a story that would and how might we move um, move to action based on that. It, there's a whole body of work around it. Russ Harris is particularly famous for it in Australia and he also developed that um, choice points framework that I was um, talking about earlier moving towards moving away towards moves away moves so um, I'd recommend your listeners kind of double click on Russ and his work and and there'll be much much more information on it there. I, I'm loving this already and I'm gonna I've got some homework to do now I've got an insatiable curiosity as I said to you before we started today so that's going to be my homework to go and study and I'm loving what I hear I'd love to play it back to you and, and just make sure I, I've got it so our reality of the world gets 
somewhat um, skewed by the stories that we tell ourselves, our, our perception. So the story that we st- uh, tell ourselves about ourselves, including limiting beliefs of, of what yeah. we think that we can't do, for example. Yeah. And what I'm hearing is a, se- a step back to either a second position or a third position and challenging whether those stories are, are true or just a story that we made up in our head. And is that story serving us? And if it's not serving us, what needs to be challenged here? And, and, and what's, yeah, absolutely. So any lived experience is subjective. And this is how, you know, you and I can sit in this same podcast interview and we might have have had the same experience in terms of we spent this time together, but we would come away from it and describe it differently because of, you know, everything that comes to it from our individual lived experiences up until this point and our values and our belief system, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. So, yeah, so so the stories in your head are like the internal radio that's helping you make sense of what's going on, why it's going on, your sense making constantly. And this narrative, these stories, sometimes they help us. But often they don't. Often Mm. they trip us up. They tell us things that are not going to help us be productive or constructive in in a moment, in an experience. Sometimes that voice in in our head is the most mean voice that we ever hear in the day. And it's it's recognizing that that voice is not truth. That voice is you interpreting what you are understanding from the experience in front of you. Um, And in and so to it's that letting go of that internal radio being truth it's not it's not necessarily a lie but it is an interpretation of your experience and understanding that and separating that from that can be really really helpful if that internal radio is not on a very constructive station if it's not playing you very helpful music very helpful narrative lines. I love it, Paige, and I can see it as a great way for people to get over those imposter syndrome and, and, and limiting beliefs if they do challenge the stories that they tell themselves. Yeah, excellent. You said something else that really got my attention as well. When we're talking about this grey area and we were navigating the tricky waters, you said gut feeling or words to that effect. You didn't say head, right? So tell us more about why you said it doesn't feel right. You didn't say it doesn't doesn't you don't think right you don't rationalize it you said it doesn't feel right tell us more about that well partly you know it's connected with what we've just talked about mick in terms of you know the what the thoughts in our head are our sense making and our narrative around what we're experiencing but often that is driven by ego and i don't and and i'm using the psychological term ego in terms of it's it's the it's the sense of us feeling being a separate entity and what and the ego's role is to keep us safe right mm-hmm. now safe and, and we can even go to if we want to go to a, a physiological right the brain's the predominant wiring and the predominant purpose of the brain is actually to manage our energy system and to keep us safe so survival first mm-hmm. and then kind of effective functioning of all of our systems second And so what the ego is, if you like, is the psychological construct of that dynamic. So what the ego will do is if there's a situation where you might stretch yourself or a situation where you might be exposed in some way, ego, which is your thinking, will go, will send you, will will basically be going, oh, are you sure you want to do that? There's a risk here. And we'll send you that kind of narrative um storyline that will make you go oh not sure i want to do this i don't think i can do this mm. the purpose of which is to keep you safe what that doesn't necessarily do though is allow you to live your values and beliefs into the world because sometimes to to be true to who we are um means that we are expanding in some way it means that we're going outside of our comfort ju- uh, comfort zone and so alongside this kind of busy quite noisy voice up here there is a quieter voice mm. there is a quieter voice and and um it, and this is where i say spend some time with yourself uh, to find that quieter voice and that that quieter voice is not ego trying to keep you safe it's 
Some people might use the word, it's your soul voice, mm. it's your true voice, it's your small voice, kind of asking you, inviting you to listen listen to the truth of who you are. And that gut feeling that we sometimes go, oh, yeah, what's your gut instinct? I believe that that's what that's about. That's, uh, mm. oh, what, what do I really feel about this? If I dial down the volume on my internal radio and the stories that I'm making up about this, What's my what's my true feeling? What's my truth around this? Um, and I find that I either locate that in my heart or in my gut. Mm. Um, and when I slow down and turn the volume down enough in my head, then I'm able to really listen to that voice. So what I'm hearing here is really interesting because we, we talk a lot about five fundamental human needs like glasses, uh, survival, love and belonging, power, fun, and freedom, right? And we, we talk about survival always being the number one. Uh, am I under threat right now? But then we also talk about what is your limiting belief and, and what is the thing that's holding you back? And quite often the answer is it's yourself. It's yourself that's like self-doubt kills more dreams than failure ever did. It's because you don't you don't put yourself out there in the first place. So this survival instinct, what I'm hearing from you, this is what I want to test with you. Your brain is going, don't put yourself out there. You're going to get yourself hurt. You know, what are other people going to think? Are they going to criticize you? Is it going, you know, I don't want to be hurt. I want to survive. I want to stay in my comfort zone. But if you stay inside your comfort zone, that you will never grow and you and you will never achieve your full potential. Is that what I'm hearing? So it's that no, that voice is trying to protect you, but in reality, it's holding you back. Absolutely. And the beautiful framework out of uh, Dr. David Rock's research, the neuroscience research, he wrote a great book called um, uh, Your Brain at Work. And in there, there's the SCARF model, S-C-A-R-F. And they're the triggers for this kind of, threat response in our brains and in, yes it's safety but it's also um it's also um relatedness it's fairness it's autonomy it's control and it's status mm. and so it's not just about physical uh threat there are all these other triggers that our brain and there's been uh, research around this that shows that actually there's as much pain triggered by or the the brain wiring in your in um sorry, the neural network in your brain for pain is as triggered as much by um, physical injury and those same networks are triggered to the same extent by a loss of either relatedness or social status. So when we feel that we're being that you talked about belonging as one of those five needs and that can feel threatened yeah. by either a social status threat in, in some way I am seen as less or a relatedness threat in that in some way I am being separated from my tribe or I am being, I'm, I'm not being welcomed in some way. And so the threat response in our brains is just as strong and exactly the same places as when we suffer a physical injury. So we can't underestimate the, the psychological threats that we're kind of aware of and maybe responding to day to day that actually mean we end up playing and leadering in a smaller and smaller space. Mm. And that's where that spending time with yourself, being able to find that quiet voice that isn't about safety. It's about tr truth, the truth of you, the understanding of who you want to be, how you want to be, what your values are, what your beliefs are, what it means for you to walk that true path rather than getting caught up in the I need to stay safe. I need to, I need to, I need to of this. I think we're tapping into an amazing part of high performance mindset here at this point. And the big takeaway for me on what we're hearing so far is when we hear survival, it's not just about caveman days of staying, uh, you know, alive from predators. It's also about feeling under threat from a social status point of view or a love and belonging. Yeah. Yeah. Really powerful. And what's really interesting, Mick, is that once you've got got an understanding of those, and I use David Rock's framework because it's just really easy, and and you can you can see how different things could trigger the same threat response through a different lens. So let me give you an example. So 
for example, the, the status one, that can be triggered just by someone wanting to put raise a hand in a in a meeting and not be asked to contribute. That's a public setting whereby they've they've been, you know, they've put themselves forward, they've made themselves vulnerable, they've put themselves at risk by saying, I have something to contribute here. And they've then not been invited to make that contribution. And so no one else may have noticed that in the room. No one else may be giving it a second thought. But to that person, they're like, I've just been snubbed. I've just been shunned. Now, equally, there's another side to that status coin. And I will just use this one um, to show how we can leverage them as well in that um, that idea of being publicly um, being being in public in terms of your behavior when we turn when we turn to accountability, understanding that helps us actually set accountability up to be more successful because we know that if we ask someone to do to take responsibility for something that is going to be delivered publicly or that has an accountability back to a group, there's more chance that they'll do it. They'll do, yeah, they'll follow through. Yeah, so there's two sides to each of these things. We can fall into a threat response, but equally we can use them to leverage high performance too. The interesting thing is not the letting go of that as well, right? So yes, everyone wants to feel like they matter. And I love the example you use where someone sticks up their hand in a town hall meeting and they don't get asked to to address the, the group. Everyone else might have not even noticed it or or three minutes later they've forgotten it happened. But that person it happened to probably hangs on to it for the next day, the next week, the whatever, right? So the easier that we can let go of these things, the easier we can get on with it, right? Yeah, really interesting. In in your purpose statement, you talk about surfacing uncomfortable truths to break through and lead themselves, their teams and their organizations in a better way. Give us an example of what you mean by surfacing an uncomfortable truth. So one of the ones that, that I, I often start talking with leaders about is that leadership is broken like what what we thought good leadership looks like what we've been kind of what we've been sold or or trained or held up as good leadership nah it's not working hasn't worked for decades and we've kind of been going la 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 not look not looking not listening and the uncomfortable truth is we can't afford to do that anymore we cannot afford to pretend that what we thought good, leader, good leadership looked like is working. And I think our experience over the last couple of years and the fundamental um, shifting of things through the COVID pandemic have just brought to the surface things that were maybe just bubbling underneath and now are kind of clear and present in front of us. The uncomfortable truth is we're not the other side of understanding what the answer is to that. I think that we're, we're getting there and as I'm reading research and as I'm reading kind of opinion pieces around leadership and leadering and leaders and how as we move into, I don't know, are we post-pandemic? I don't know, you know, what a bit, what's being asked of leaders now? What are the expectations? How have they changed? What does that mean? And it's certainly what I'm exploring as I research my next book around partnering and, and shifting the leadership paradigm, which has been kind of up down like a figure of eight forever and ever now onto its side, onto partnering whereby we've got an infinity sign. We're actually, we're, we're partnering with, we're leading with rather than leading for or doing leadership to. Um, and I think that that's an uncomfortable truth because we're, we're kind of letting go, but hang on, I was taught this and this and this, and I've been shown this and this and this. Is, is what it takes to be a leader. And you're saying none of that's working. And, and one of the questions I reflect, I ask the leaders to reflect on then is, well, what do you reckon? Do you think it's working? How are you going? Are you burnt out? Are you stressed? Do you feel like you're overcommitted? Haven't, haven't got the resources to do what's being asked of you? How are you? How's your team going? Got stress, got anxiety, got burnout? Like, so, so, so something's not working here. Um, and I think there's a beautiful opportunity for us to, if we're brave enough, really think about what is it that we need to co-create now that's going to serve us going forward. Um, and so that's a pretty uncomfortable truth when we're kind of letting go of what we've been told good looks like and what we've been holding up as the way to the way to be and do for the last 
however many years. Yeah, it's really interesting one to challenge. And I think we're still learning. We're, we're not there yet, but I, I feel like there's a shift about to occur. We're not there yet because the engagement levels are actually going down. They're not going up at the moment. They're going down, right? So depending on whether you read ATD or Gallup research, it's anything between 16 to 20% of people in the world truly love their job and like their boss. That's it, right? 16 to 20%. And we've had these role models of alpha style leaders for, for a long time. And we've even had rhetoric, oh, you need, to be, you need to be more out there. You need to do this. You need to do that. And all of those things have all been not necessarily the right way to engage people and, and get the best out of them. Fully agree with you on this partnering and co-creation model, right? So the, the leader of tomorrow is, is going to be someone that's able to tap in to the superpowers of everyone in their team and create an environment where everyone can thrive. And the, the, the sum of what you create will be far greater than the sum of its parts. If, and, and that's where we need to go. And I think the, the right challenging question is to tap into your own psychology and go, well, do you like being told what to do? Yeah, exactly. No one does. And we don't. No one likes being no. told what to do. So why have we been doing it for three decades or however many decades, right? So, so I think if you tap into, come back to that amalgam leader again, what are the, who are the leaders that really inspired you uh, to great heights? And they aren't the, the dictators. They're not the ones that did the alpha style leadership, right? So if we tap into, hey, what works for us and learn about that, where we might be in a place to be ready to create that co-creation space. How does, how does that sit with you? I think you're absolutely on the, on the money there, Mick. And, and I think that um, almost, so I think that there's two, I think there's two big chewy pieces around this. One is that we've got to unlearn so much. Leaders will have to unlearn so much. And so much of it has become deeply embedded in their identity, in their way of being and doing at a habitual level, that that's quite an unlearning, you know, and I'm always thinking, do you know what? I reckon it might be generational. I really think that could well be the time frame that we're looking at in that the unlearning piece is just too big for us to expect it to happen in the next five to 10 years. But the next generation of leaders that comes through, yes, maybe. And, you know, I, I lecture and research at university and it's, it's almost like, right, so what's the leverage point for that? The leverage point is what are all of our leadership and business studies courses teaching is good leadership. And until that starts to change, that's like going upstream in this whole conversation, yeah. right? Because that then changes what good looks like, what what we're holding up as a model of leadership that needs to, that brings out the best in groups and teams and organizations and communities but until that changes we're just going to like the production line is still producing the same we're still having to retrofit yeah. this this different way of thinking about what good leadership is rather than it being actually kind of um taught and embedded through schools through universities etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's just the formal education system yeah. so i think that's one side of it i think the other side of it is i don't know that we have I don't know that we have, and this is a huge generalization, so I'm just going to say that before I say it. I don't know that we have people that want to partner. I think that we have been doing leadership to and for our people for so long that they're like battery chickens. Yeah. And what partnering does, it says, hey, here's a big field. Go free range. And they're like, I don't know how to do free range. I was quite happy in my battery pen, thanks. Can you just come back and tell me how to do free range? I'm like, no, 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 that's not the point. You get, we get to partner in free range. Where do you want to go? And I'll come and partner with you over there. I'm like, I don't. I just want to be in here. So, so there's there's this two sides of this dynamic that's been created. One is the unlearning of these leadership dynamics, but also it's creating the capacity to partner in our teams and people. And so we've got both sides of this dynamic to kind of address and as I say I don't know if that's if that's going to be an intergenerational thing that happens I've definitely seen and felt that so I err towards the the partnering side 
uh, to the point where sometimes I've had staff members in in previous companies get frustrated with me sometimes. Just just tell me what you want. Just tell me what you want, right? So, and I'm trying to ask them better questions and try to lead them and you know, on a journey of their own self discovery of where they want to go, etc. I think the answer is in purpose alignment. All right. So, so if you're, we'll come back to clarity for a moment. So, if you're a leader that's able to articulate with deep clarity your purpose, your vision, your values and beliefs, you will then surround yourself with people that believe in the things that you believe and you'll be able to inspire them into meaningful action around your worthy cause. And then the purpose alignment comes by the leader pointing towards the North Star and say, this is where we need to get to, but team, I'm, in, I'm paying you a lot of money because I believe in you and I'm paying for your intellect. I'm not paying for your arms and legs. You, t- you tell me the path on how we're going to get to that North Star and what, are the, what is the journey going to look like? What are the stumble, stumbling blocks and how do you propose we get around those stumbling blocks? So the empowerment that the person can get on with it and make their own decisions but with the vision that they're all heading in generally the same direction. It doesn't even have to be identical same direction, but they're all heading generally in the same direction, but they've got their own map and their own compass and they're navigating their own way along the way. I, I think that's going to be the answer as opposed to the free range element of here, here's a blank sheet of paper, off you go, which means that people could go some go left, some go right, some go south, some go north, etc. That purpose alignment would at least have everyone on the same map and have the same same-ish destination in mind, but they can c- come to Glass's choice theory. They have their own freedom of choice of how they get there. Yeah, and, and, and that, you're absolutely right with that, Mick. And I, um, so a couple of things um, popped for me there as you were speaking. One is that... When we get clear about values, what we are creating are guiding heuristics Mm. for ourselves and our team around how we want to do the work that needs to be done. Now, I'll come back to, you know, let's come back to a value, a learning value. How I show up in a learning value might be different to you. And so the question becomes, we value learning in this team. What could that look like for you? Because then I have a voice. I, you are partnering with me. You're saying, you're giving me the guiding heuristic. The guiding heuristic is we value learning in this team. What would that look like for you in your role as you complete this task, as we move through the next six months? And so you are partnering with me. You're not just saying, hey, do what you like. You're saying, no, we're focusing on value. And that's that kind yeah. of the directionality, right? You're saying this is... And so that's where, for me, I think this idea of clarity around values, first individual values as a leader, but then also what does that mean for a team that I want to lead? And those two things need to have um, a relationship in terms of your individual personal values, how they show up in your leadership and the culture that you create in your team, because you can't can't help but that, Mm -hmm. because as a leader of a team, you are the most potent creator of culture, Mm -hmm. full stop. Yeah. Um, And the other thing uh, that you mentioned there, Mick, that I thought was really interesting was I think you you absolutely nailed it in terms of when we've got people where we're paying for their intellectual capacity, we're not paying for their arms and legs, et cetera, et cetera. And that's that's the contribution, the main contribution that that we're looking for. But and equally, not every role is like that. Mm. So what happens when actually – the role that a a team has is arms and legs. There might be some degree of intellectual capacity that's needed for coordination and for scheduling and that kind of thing. But actually it is a pretty kind of manual type role that they're in. I'm thinking things like call centers. I'm thinking things like, you know, um, customer service staff where yes, they need to be present, but they're probably, they may not be, as intellectually, they're not like knowledge workers. Um, and I think equally that understanding of, of being able to be clear around why their work matters, how it fits into a bigger picture, yeah. what the purpose of it is, is equally important, if not more so, 
for for those kinds of roles as it is for the for perhaps the more knowledge worker type roles and it comes back to us as as formal leaders and I'll talk I'll talk to it through that lens to be able to articulate that in a very clear and a very um understandable way um, and and if we're not able to do that because we haven't done that action precedes clarity if we haven't done that work then we're not serving our people in the way that we should. We're certainly not partnering with them. And so, you know, one of the things that came out of my research around accountability was that clarity of expectations is one of two critical success factors. And clarity of expectations or clarity of purpose is just as much a part of that as is the, these are the specific tasks that I need you to do in your responsibilities. Mm. There's two really powerful things in everything you've just said there, Paige. The first one around the heuristics and we come back to the values and beliefs. So they, those those things that will govern the things that you do, but also the boundaries of what you won't do and and then the culture. What culture do we want to create? And that's the culture that we will then honour and celebrate and reward and what, what behaviour will we not tolerate? It's not on this playing field and the leader's got a huge role to play there. And then on the purpose, yeah, give clarity of purpose of the overall mission and vision and then hold space and help people to discover how their individual work contributes to that mission and purpose. And then when they believe in it, when they believe in that what they're doing, even if it's a, uh, some people might look at it and go, that's a minor task. But when they believe that what they're doing contributes to the bigger mission and the worthy cause, they're going to knock it out of the park every day, right? They're not just going to go, I'm doing this because I need the paycheck. I'm doing this because my boss told me to. They're doing it because they believe in the impact of what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so important. And, you know, it does, it speaks to different types of accountability. We often think of accountability just as being about task-based behaviours. But equally, like this whole other set of behaviours that actually creates culture. Um, and those, we might call them values-based behaviours. But in, unless we can be specific about these and, and this is the this is the thing isn't it it's about how can we be descriptive rather than prescriptive yeah. so I, I love this distinction I think it's really useful for, for leaders is you need to be able to describe what you're talking about yeah. so if you've got kindness of one of your team values you need to imagine that you've got a team member that says what do you mean what is that what do you want me to do and so you need to have a number of examples of what kindness might look like, but then the most powerful work action that precedes clarity is to get the team to say, so what do you think kindness could look like within our team? And let's 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 not go with what the descriptors are out here. Let's create our own. And then you have behaviors that you can invite them into accountability over. Because they've created them. You're not you're not doing leadership to them. You're not doing the work for them. You're doing it with them. And then you get to have a really clear, clean conversation when perhaps they're not showing up in those behaviors around their responsibility and the accountability that comes with it. Huge amounts of ownership there, Paige, right? So if they've written good example, these are the behaviors that we want. If and they question, oh, what do you mean by that? Well, what do you think I mean? Or what would you like to see? And if they've, if I have a saying, who's holding the pen? And if they're the ones that held the pen when they crafted that credo or they crafted those values and beliefs, then they're going to have massive ownership of it and they're going to do it. And then when it comes to accountability, it'll be, well, you did actually help write these things, right? So you want, do you want to live by it or you just want it to be a pretty picture on the wall, right? <laughs> And, you know, Brené Brown's work around values, you know, talks about do you just do you actually walk your talk? You know, do you, do you just profess them or do you put them into action? And there's been beautiful research done by Cy Wakeman, who's a, a sociologist out of the U.S. And she's written a couple of books, one called Reality Based Leadership and another called No Ego. And it speaks to the idea around um, it speaks to our obsession with engagement. Okay. Right. And, and you, you were talking earlier about, you know, our engagement metrics are going all the wrong yeah. way. And I think I believe this speaks to that dynamic of we need to unlearn leadering okay. um, on what good looks like, what we've been told good looks like. But also we need to up, kind of upskill and, and get a different expectation from our team members 
around their role in partnering. Because the thing about engagement is there's it's almost like I I I expect you to create engagement for me. So if you could please give me an environment in which I can be engaged. Yeah. And I and I get there's a certain yes, we need to create healthy, you know, work environments that enable people to thrive. But that's as far as we can go. We can't do the thriving for them. We as leaders, we can't I can't make you be engaged, Mick. I can give you I can give you resources, I can offer you learning, I can make sure there's a psychologically safe and healthy environment for you to do your work. I can give you appropriate resources, blah blah blah, all of those things, and you could still be disengaged. I I can't do your engagement for you and I can't do engagement to you. And I believe, and, and it's this is based out of Cy Wakeman's research, actually we're measuring the wrong thing. Because if we look at accountability, people that are willing to show commitment, willing to um, take learning risks, um, willing to see things through and persevere and take responsibility for their actions, these are the people that are engaged, right? And so engagement is actually the outcome of people being invited into responsibility and accountability, and some people, you know, we talk about internal, external locus of control. It's a it's a psychological term. But what it basically means is, do I believe that I have control, that I have influence over my environment, my experiences and the outcomes that that I have in, in the world? And that's an internal locus of control. When you believe that you do have that, you have an mm. internal locus of control. An external locus of control says, no, 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 I don't. I, I'm I'm just, it's if, if something goes well, I was lucky. If something goes badly, it wasn't my fault. I was a victim. Yeah. And so you can see like I'm I'm at the at the ebb and flow of life and I don't have control over it. And it's people with this internal locus of control who believe that in cause and effect of their actions and, and what they do and their beliefs and mindsets, these are the people that are more engaged, but they're more engaged because they take ownership, responsibility, and accountability for how they show up, what they do, and the outcomes they achieve. And that's what drives engagement. So I'm I'm certainly on board with sides research around we're measuring the wrong thing. Mm. What we actually need to be doing is double clicking on accountability and helping people who are willing to step into ownership, responsibility, and accountability coach those people up, coach others across and recognize some people will never choose to get there. I'm thinking of three layers here, Paige, and I want to build this up and see what you think. So as a leader, we'll start with the psychological safety, right? So if we don't provide that psychological safety, people won't feel that they can raise their hand and say something. Then I heard the word invite. So we need to then invite them to the party, make them aware that they are safe, and then off we go. And then about the culture we spoke about before, that we need to be ready to celebrate and reward the behaviours that we are looking for them to blossom with, including accountability. So we celebrate and reward that accountability. And then... I'm going to circle back to the psychological safety. If there is a blame-free culture, as in, uh, and I'll use that carefully, a blame-free culture where it's a learning environment where people can safely put up their hand and say, I made a mistake and I'm taking full accountability to that. They need to have that safety that they're not going to get massive retribution uh, associated with it. So, So I think it starts with safety which is interesting with what you were saying before about the brain kicking in and going, stopping you from acting acting because you don't feel safe, the invitation to participate, and then the reward and celebration when someone does take full accountability for their actions. How does that sit with you? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's a, a beautiful way to, to layer um, what an accountability um process or no what an accountability culture um would could look like um and what it speaks to mick is i mentioned earlier that 
there were two success factors that help us reset accountability because the reality is it's been used as kind of a stick. You know, if I were to say to you, hey, Mick, can we go out to lunch? I just want to talk to you about um, uh, we need to have an accountability conversation or yeah. something similar, you know, shivers and ugh, and anxiety around that conversation. And that's because often accountability is used like when things are less retrievable or not retrievable. And so it becomes a punitive conversation around what you've done wrong, how you are wrong, but it's too late. Like we can't do anything about this now. Um, and so it, it just feels it, it's it, all of those scar factors, those threat factors are actually triggered. Mm. Um, and, and so the second factor alongside clarity of expectations is quality of relationship. And that directly speaks to, you know, how safe do I feel in our relationship? Um, and I talk about um, quality of relationship be going from barren to fruitful. Um, and the reason I use that language, it's quite deliberate, is, you know, when you've got a barren relationship, there's nothing, nothing coming out of it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's fractious. It doesn't mean that we're in conflict. It's just barren. Yeah. And what it speaks to is, I'm sure many of your listeners will recognize this, a culture of politeness where on face value, we're all yes and, mm, and agreeing and la, 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 la. But there's nothing coming out of it. That relationship is barren as. Whereas fruitful accountability relationships, there's all kinds of creativity. They're, 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 like, they're juicy. They've got nourishment. We're able to have the conversations that need to be had, even when they are uncomfortable, but equally they're fruitful. It doesn't mean we're best buddies. We're not necessarily, you know, spending every lunchtime together or going down the pub or watching the footy together, but they are fruitful accountability relationships because we're able to talk about the things that we need to talk about in, at the time that we need to talk about them. So the accountability is an ongoing dialogue it's not something that happens when, quite frankly, the situation can't be saved anyway. So what I'm hearing there, Paige, is really an interesting dynamic in that relationship. So if you don't have a relationship based on safety, that's when the accountability conversation is going to be a defensive or deflective conversation where it's always someone else's fault or it was out of my control, et cetera. And of course, sometimes it is out of your control, but... But you know what I mean, the, uh, oh, this was what I was told to do or this was what I was given or you get the idea, the defensive and deflective uh, conversation. But then the other thing, this barren thing, I want to talk more about that. What I'm hearing there is if the ground of the relationship is not fertile ground, you're also not going to grow anything together. So it needs to be that co-creation environment where you're ready to work together. So it, so it can't be kind of the defensive or deflective, but for it to be grow, it also needs to be fertile ground that is fostering a relationship where people can have that candor, can have that ability to have a growing conversation. Absolutely. And that's why what I talk about is what we're aiming for is an accountability partnership. Um, and what that means is it, it means that the, the person, so two roles in accountability, the accountor, like the employer, is the person asking for accountability. The accountee is the person like an employee, is the person being asked for accountability. And so like naturally there is, you might think there's an up-down power dynamic in that, right? Someone is being, is asking for something. Someone is being asked to give something. And what I'm suggesting is that it doesn't have to be like that. It can be this partnering dynamic. And to do that, what we do is um, we, one, we lead with questions. And I was so uh, great to hear you talk about questions earlier in our chat. You know, leading with questions is inviting autonomy, it's inviting, where are you at with this? What are your thoughts on this? And going there first. Now, it doesn't then mean that you just accept what comes back if, if you know that that really isn't what's needed here or what's going to meet meet the um, requirements of the task or whatever the, the circumstance is. But it does mean that you start that dialogue and you co-create the expectations. And also, the thing about fruitful accountability relationships is kind of nothing's left on the table. So uh, 
I talk about having coaching conversations and they are coaching ladders for accountability that mean that we go right the way through to talking about. And so how does this work connect in with others? How will what we do here impact others? And what are the consequences of it not going as we've discussed here? So that there's nothing that's hidden. There's nothing that's kind of smoke or mirrors. Everything is, you know, we talked about clarity. Everything is super clear. It's clean. It's on the table. We know where things are at. And what that means is any follow-up conversations get have that as a reference point um and so there isn't any oh, i didn't know i couldn't I didn't realize we make sure that we've actually gone gone there <laughs> we've 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 um even had the uncomfortable conversation around if this continues then the consequences will be um and i'm very clear when i um when i speak with leaders and ceos about this not every accountability story has a happy ending and that's the uncomfortable truth around accountability. And what's ours to own as leaders is to take responsibility for having even those uncomfortable conversations, because um, that's what our responsibility is in terms of um, making sure that the, the greater uh, good is met. Clarity is to provide around where does this person fit? How do they see themselves in the world? How do they see their contribution? And if it's not a fit, then that's okay. There's probably another place in the world where they can fit, either in the same organisation in a different way or not in this organisation. They might be better served somewhere else. That That is uncomfortable, but I think that's where it goes. I like the word consequence that you spoke about and I think of it both negatively and positively and I also connect it back to purpose. So if you have that consequence conversation, you can say to the individual involved or not say, ask the question, what do you think would happen if you were not able to do this or you stopped doing that? And when you think about how this would impact another human being if I stopped doing this, purpose can start emerging for that person. And if you ask things like, and what positive impact would happen if you're able to achieve this, once again, purpose can emerge. And you could even say, and what would happen if you did more of this? Ah, Ah, and now they understand their contribution to the big mission and to the big purpose of the organisation. Yeah, really powerful. All right, we danced around something that we didn't have a chance to dig into and I'd like to do it now, anti-fragility. Tell us yeah. more about anti-fragility. Okay. So um, I started looking into this before the pandemic, um, which is kind of ironic. I was doing the research for it. Um and I read it in a book by Mark Manson, and I'd never come across the idea before. And uh, it, Mark, in, in his book about hope, he put forward that in every moment, like we have a choice as to whether we move towards anti-fragility or away from it. Um, and I was like, oh, what's this? So I read Nassim's original work, and it's this idea, and, and it's his work is grounded in, in economic systems. So when you look at kind of stocks and shares, some organizations and some um, companies, as, as the market goes through tremendous volatility, they come out of that tremendous volatility better in some way. And so they, this idea of anti-fragile, it's not just what's fragile and what's robust. So fragile gets broken, robust withstands, and resilience sits in that spot because you're bouncing back. But actually something that's anti-fragile improves or gets better in some way through that disruption, through that uncertainty. Um and so as I read that work, I was like, oh, what could that mean for leaders, for human systems, for teams, for organizations? Because I've taught resilience for years um, in my lecturing at the University of Melbourne, the Centre for Wellbeing Science. Um, my training with Seligman at Geelong Grammar School had resilience as a key part of it. And there's been beautiful research into resilience over the last like 30, 40 years or so. But it only gets you so far. It gets you back to where you were before. So in our rapidly changing world, if you only go back to where you, before, where you were before, but everything else is moving forward or moving in some way, then you'll, you soon become disconnected from, you know, and relevant to what's around you. And so then you go to something like post-traumatic growth, 
which is, you know, learning and changing fundamentally to something that is traumatic, but that at the at the other side of it, you have in some way got better or some way evolved, improved. But that is quite a long and quite a like a deconstructive, the idea of trauma and fundamental beliefs and aspects of your identity being shattered and rebuilt in some way. And over a period of time, they're being able to be seen and a, a, a benefit from that. And so anti-fragility in a, in a human system lens kind of speaks to what I call tiny post-traumatic growth, because rather than it being a complete deconstruction and a breaking of identity, it's just it's just little kind of um, discomforts that you learn forward through. And, and the learning loop is a primary tool through which we can do that. But the question that we hold is, how can we be better coming out of this than we were coming into it? And as a guiding anti-fragile heuristic that's the thing that I encourage leaders and teams to use and we get to define what better is better does not equal more better does not equal um, um, more capacity it might mean doing less it might mean um, more space it might mean slowing down it might mean a, um, a focus on values it might mean um, actually spending more time getting to know ourselves. Like that might be what better looks like. Um, and so it's a whole of life better, not just a performance in the traditional kind of dashboard KPIs sense. This, this is really interesting and you might be hitting on hitting the nail on the head of a problem that I've had with the word resilience for some time. So hear me out here and see, see what you think. So for me, what you're talking about, getting stronger through adversity, embracing the struggle and getting stronger and stronger through the struggle requires that double loop and, and triple loop learning that we we're talking about before. Because if you're not doing the, the work about what did I learn from this about how I think about the world? What did I learn about this? learn from this about myself, you're actually not getting stronger. And in fact, if you, if you just stay in single loop or no learning at all, in fact, the struggle is just going to wear you down over time, right? So if we're doing the work, the learning work, resilience and anti-fragility is a wonderful thing. But what I saw for a period of time, we seem to be getting better at it now. What I saw when resilience was a huge buzz, buzzword, 10 years ago, I saw a lot of leaders telling people, you just need to be, lead, you just need to be more resilient. You need to toughen up, toughen up. No, resilience is something that builds as a muscle because you're learning. It's not, I just toughen up and I deflect everything off me and I pretend it didn't happen. It's the deep work. It's the deep learning. That's what makes you stronger. And telling someone to be more resilient doesn't make them more resilient helping them to learn from their struggle makes them more resilient. Your thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I was involved in, and I'm in, I'm still involved in research, but we went out to the Australian market, Australian um, workers uh, about five times over the last two and a bit years. And interestingly, what we found and what you're speaking to shadows a discussion around thriving and struggle. Mm. So this idea of thriving being optimal functioning, mm. which is what has come out of the well-being science. And, and, and you know, if, if we think about, so what does good look like? We, we've shattered what good looks like in terms of leadership because it just isn't working anymore. But we had this idea of what good looked like in terms of optimal functioning, and we called it flourishing or thriving or optimal well-being. Mm. But what came in with that was this idea that it that it happened, it kind of just happened by osmosis. You know, optimal thriving was was almost kind of moving through life like like the swan on top of the water, you know, with ease and grace and everything coming easily. And yet the lived experience of thriving is often not that. Mm -hmm. In fact, when I ask uh, the leaders that I work with, you know, when have you felt most proud? What's something you are really proud of in your life? And now tell me about the journey to that. Was there struggle? Was there effort? 
were there times where you just wanted to throw in the towel? And invariably the answer is yes. Mm. So we need to reshape what good look good looks like in terms of optimal um, well-being or optimal thriving, because often inherent in that are experiences of struggle. And what happens if we reframe what good looks like from a thriving perspective so that it's actually expanded to include experiences of struggle, then it means that as we have those experiences, we don't go, oh, something's wrong, something's broken, I need to kind of stop or freeze or get small. We're able to kind of accept, no, this is part of an experience that is taking me potentially towards thriving. Um, And interestingly, in this research that we did, Mick, at the beginning of, so end of 2019, pre-COVID, we had about 20% of Australian workers, we uh, surveyed a 1,000 of them, that said they were thriving with ease. When we went back out to market in about March, which was as we were going into our first kind of uh, restrictions, that number had halved, but they had gone straight to being, to feeling that they were really struggling And so this thriving with ease group, there was a fragility to them because they simply didn't have the skills and capacity to cope as the uncertainty and disruption increased. And the metaphor I use is they were kind of like Formula One cars. They could perform to a really high level, but in a really narrow band of circumstances, like it needs to be a smooth road and it needs to be kind of wide and they need to be able to you know, take racing lines in and out of the corners. Whereas really, really what we need to be is a high performing four wheel drive. So that if we're on that kind of open road, sure, we can go fast, but equally we can take the lumps and bumps of life. We can take steep inclines and we're able to move forward even in those circumstances as well. So I think this idea of what does good look like from thriving, actually struggle is often a part of our journey towards thriving and an acceptance of that and expanding our idea of what good looks like in relation to that is super important as as we lead and as we just experience life more generally. I think that's a great takeaway for everyone right there and just embrace that metaphor between the F1 and the and the full drive and if you take that away from today's interview that's something for you to think about what is going to make you stronger over time and how you become stronger over time is the learning loop. If you don't do the learning, you don't get stronger. You just get worn down. And if everything just goes perfectly forever, you don't, you don't learn anything. So it all comes back to learning again. That's just wonderful, Paige. Thank, thank you so much for today. I'm going to draw a close to the, kind of that part of the interview and go to our closing round, our rapid round. So what's the one thing that you know now, Paige, that you wish you knew when you were 20? <laughs> Uh, everything is temporary. And that's so powerful because whether I'm in the midst of a chewy struggle and I'm really trying to get my way through it or whether I'm absolutely in a moment of joyful bliss and connection, everything is temporary. And so it helps me get through the tough stuff and go, I'll get up at some point, I'll be the other side of this or whether I'm in a moment of joy and I just want to make sure I savor this and, and express any gratitude, appreciation, love that I have for the people I'm with. Um, Everything is temporary serves me well. Very powerful. What a great message. Uh, What's your favorite book? So I have discovered a writer called Bell Hooks. Um, he's, she's an American writer. She's actually a feminist writer. And I've never read any feminist texts. And, and she's written over 20, but she's written a beautiful couple of books that I've dived into and really enjoyed. Um, one is called All About Love. And the other is called The Will to Change. And they talk about patriarchy and power dynamics in a way that is not kind of feminism led. But it's, it's absolutely been a revelation for me in terms of understanding how patriarchy is not based in gender, it's based in power. Um, and, uh, yeah, I am loving those books and, and giving them away as gifts oh, to, wow. okay. uh, to my good friends and colleagues right now. Yeah, well done. I right, love it. And what's your favourite quote, Paige? So um, I'm going to go to Bell Hooks as one of my favourite authors right now. And one of the things that I'm really exploring as I do the research on partnering is what it means to lead with love um, and not 
and, and the the more kind of expanded understanding of love. So I'm I really love this quote from Belle, and she says, "To know love, we have to tell the truth to ourselves and to others." And I think that speaks to the lovely know yourself, do the work with yourself that we were chatting to earlier, Mick. Wonderful. All right. Final question is, I'm sure there's going to be many people that are enthralled by what you've been sharing today, uh, Paige. How do people get hold of you if they'd like to know more? Oh, well, my website is the best place to go, which is simply drpagewilliams.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn, so you can connect with me there. Um, and yeah, I'd love to love to hear from you. Wonderful. And we'll put the links in the show notes so people can find you. This has just been amazing today, Paige. I feel richer for this conversation and I know the audience will as well. So thank you so much. Now, thank you so much, Mick. I've really enjoyed our conversation. So rich. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Leadership Project at MickSpears.com. A huge call out to Faris Sadek for his video editing of all of our video content and to all of the team at TLP. Joanne Goes On, Gerald Calabo, and my amazing wife, Say Spears. I could not do this show without you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Leadership Project YouTube channel where we bring you interesting videos each and every week. And you can follow us on social, particularly on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. Now, in the meantime, please do take care, look out for each other, and join us on this journey as we learn together and lead together. 